Welcome back to this I-24 News Evening Edition. This is a one on one. The EU and Israel have the a historically both close and very complex relationship. It was put to the test recently with the creation of EU anti-settlement guidelines, the issue of boycotts, and growing European discontent on Israeli settlement buildings. This, of course, as the Israeli-Palestinian peace process continues. But the EU is still a major trade partner for Israel, and Israel is part of the prestigious Horizon 2020 Science and Research Program. Tonight, I have the pleasure of welcoming to our studio Lars Faborg Anderson, the European Union's ambassador to Israel. Welcome. Thank you very much for coming Thanks to for our having studio. Me. You know, um, straightforward. What is Israel doing wrong? Well, I don't think Israel is doing uh, anything wrong, particularly not now uh, when Israel is engaged in serious uh, negotiations uh, with the Palestinians on trying uh, to achieve a uh, solution to uh, this conflict uh, between uh, Israel and, and the Palestinians that have been raging for many, many years. Uh, this is a situation in which I think both parties, Israel and the Palestinians, really deserve uh, as much international support uh, as they can get. Uh, but, you know, Israelis love uh, to say all the time, all the world hates us, everybody's against us, nobody wants us in the world, nobody can understand us in the world. And sometimes Israel is experiencing, what, for example, like we said, boycotts and the horizon which was put in the question mark horizon 2020 if it will or if it will not eventually it was why is it because at the end of the day maybe israel is not let's say playing by the rules like it should be well as you said before uh, to start uh, yourself to start with uh, the um relationship uh, between uh, the European Union and Israel um, has a, a long historical subtext to it. It has uh, a, a depth and, uh, and a width uh, which make, makes it uh, unique uh, among um, uh, countries uh, that the European Union is uh, engaged with. We have a very uh, strong uh, partnership so there's so, certainly no uh, reason for uh, Israel to feel uh, that um, Europe or anyone else for that sake is uh, on, on their uh, back all the time. That being said, of course, there are in areas in which uh, we do not uh, see exactly eye to eye. Uh, settlements uh, is one of them, uh, as you mentioned before. Uh, it remains uh, our view uh, that settlement uh, expansion is uh, problematic, particularly at a time when you are trying to establish uh, trust uh, between the parties uh, necessary to conduct uh, negotiations. And that's the reason we have uh, reacted uh, every time new announcements of settlements uh, have uh, been uh, made. But I think when it comes to the Horizon 22, um, 20, uh, 2020 20 program, uh, we uh, have a, another very clear example of a situation which is a win-win situation both for Israel uh, and the EU. Israel uh, coming around uh, to join also the Horizon 2020 program as it has uh, um, joined uh, every single uh, research and technology development program of the EU since uh, 1996 is a very, very good thing, both for Europe and for uh, Israel, who is uh, world famous for its cutting edge, uh, innovative technologies, uh, something um, which is of keen interest uh, to uh, Europeans, including European research centers uh, and companies uh, who have traditionally engaged very strongly with uh, Israel on, on, on this. Now, um, as far as the guidelines are concerned, um, it's true that um, uh, we agreed uh, with the Israeli government uh, to ensure that the Horizon 2020 program only applies uh, to the Israeli side of the uh, Green Line. Uh, and this is uh, really a, a minor thing uh, if you look in practical terms, because uh, there aren't many uh, 
um, companies uh, located across uh, the, the Green Line uh, who are either interested uh, or, or capable of participating in, in Horizon 2020 anyway. Where, uh, before I will, say, I will ask you if uh, uh, you can distinguish, you know, I will ask you right now, can you distinguish between politics and science? Um, well, I mean... Not mix the two things with each well, other? Well, I mean, I think that uh, politics uh, should not uh, intentionally uh, be, be mixed up uh, with science. Science is a, is a, is a global uh, endeavor. Uh, there's an international uh, republic uh, of, of science uh, to which uh, all scientists uh, belong, and interchange between scientists is... Uh, Act, uh, absolutely essential and, and key to uh, uh, for science and, and for development uh, in, in general. Um, that being said, I think that uh, the EU as a funder uh, of uh, this program to the tune of uh, 80 billion uh, euros uh, for a seven year period has the right to say that um, uh, the money spent under the program should be spent in uh, Israel proper in what is recognized uh, as uh, Israel. And that is basically uh, the area that falls inside uh, the, uh, the Green Line. So uh, this is uh, what happened and that was what was also accepted uh, after some uh, negotiations. Uh, with the uh, by the Israeli uh, government, so in in that sense, I, I think we are on uh, on a sound footing. You know, uh, the EU is um, it's. The, the, maybe the purpose is uh, to try and be objective and look at things from a different angle, to look at things from 10 steps aside and try to capture the whole mm -hmm. uh, picture. Um, my, uh, my question is, are you capturing, uh, is the EU capturing uh, the Palestinian perspective? What is happening in the Palestinian uh, uh, territories about the corruption in the Palestinian territory, about the money that is sent to the Palestinian Authority and not being used actually for uh, education systems for uh, uh, around two million dollars that uh, mil a billion dollars that actually been sent to the Palestinian authorities and not being used for peace pur purposes but for something else for corruption for the money uh, let's say money laundering of the leaders uh, we are very focused from the uh, EU side on uh, the economic situation, financial transactions, uh, good governance, accountability, transparency uh, when it comes uh, to the Palestinian uh, Authority and the Palestinian uh, territories. As you know, uh, Europe, um, the EU and the member states are collect collectively contributing uh, over 1 billion uh, euros uh, a year on average uh, to the uh, Palestinian Authority. So we obviously have uh, a key interest in ensuring that that money is being uh, put to good use. Uh, this is what we are what, uh, doing through regular monitoring, um, issuing uh, of reports, uh, in, including auditors' uh, reports that are scrupulously uh, followed uh, up. So I mean, this is uh, an area in, in which, uh, to which we, we, we devote uh, a lot of interest. Uh, it's my colleague in East Jerusalem uh, who's uh, dealing with that, but um, you know, it's because, certainly uh, part of our from policy. From the perspective that I look at it, um, from, uh, we're talking about millions and millions of euros. With this amount of money, you could build uh, three countries, not one unbalanced country. And it's not happening. You're going to the, to the West Bank, and what we are seeing on the field in the West Bank, that this money is not being used to actually rebuilding the Palestinian society, the Palestinian economy, in order for it to get to being an independent country. Well, I mean, I would uh, refrain from commenting on that. I um, am posted here in Israel. I don't come uh, very much uh, to, uh, to the West Bank, and uh, I have uh, really no um, detailed knowledge uh, of, of, uh, to, to assess uh, the, uh, the assertion uh, that you, you are, um, are putting on the table here. Um, suffice to say, I think that, that development is uh, traditionally a complicated uh, 
uh, process. It also takes uh, an enabling environment in order to uh, ensure and be successful uh, with uh, development uh, efforts. Um, but I, I'm sure that my colleagues uh, who are working uh, on behalf of the EU uh, in the East Jerusalem and Ramallah are doing uh, their level best to ensure that the money uh, is being put to good use uh, and to uh, fight um, any kind of uh, corruption. Uh, corruption and illicit uh, use of the money uh, should it occur. And what is uh, right now the view of the EU towards the Gaza Strip? Because the situation there is very complicated. It's not in the West Bank. It's not in Israel. It's like its own island. And uh, the EU, it seems that for now, it's maybe it's comfortable for all the sizes, every single side, just mm -hmm. to not handle this situation for now. Well, I mean, um, to uh, put it briefly, um, I mean, we are condemning and totally uh, against uh, any kind of violence coming out of uh, Gaza. We think that the rockets. Uh, that at times are raining uh, down on Israel uh, from Gaza is um, utterly condemnable, uh, and we do it. Um, and uh, so, so that uh, needs to stop, and uh, it's important to, to get uh, a handle on, on uh, this issue. Uh, that being said, we also uh, acknowledge that uh, there is um, humanitarian problems uh, in Gaza um, and that the uh, normal and ordinary uh, population there is suffering from a very high rate of unemployment, uh, which is uh, running uh, well, about, uh, well above 30 um, percent, and also uh, a scarcity of, of certain um, uh, products and materials, including uh, cement and other things, uh, to rebuild uh, their houses and, and their lives, and also uh, building schools and so on and so forth. So it is a difficult uh, situation. Uh, we would like to see um, full access uh, um, across uh, the uh, crossing points uh, to Gaza for um, ordinary goods uh, that uh, do not have military application. Um, and uh, this is uh, what we are um, uh, trying to impress uh, both on the Israeli authorities and also on the Egyptian uh, authorities who uh, are responsible um, for the Rafa uh, crossing point uh, uh, as, uh, as well. Um, so we think uh, that um, by uh, increasing uh, the uh, access of uh, goods and services uh, to uh, Gaza, you will be able uh, to uh, take some of the steam off uh, the kettle, uh, and probably you would also be able to create uh, an environment that's uh, less conducive to radicalism uh, and, and violence that you are seeing now. But we realize that this is a very um, a difficult situation and a very um, difficult uh, balance to walk. I want to ask you a personal uh, question. You came from Belgium to Israel. You've been here in your position for five months. Um, what was the most surprising thing for you in this region? And do you have second thoughts about coming here? No, I absolutely uh, love being here in Israel. Um, uh, and that uh, ranges uh, from the weather to, to the people here uh, and uh, to the uh, vibrancy of your democracy. It's extremely uh, interesting uh, to follow and be part of. I haven't regretted it for one uh, single mo uh, moment. I look forward uh, to several more uh, years here. Because it seems that, you know, uh, for people who are looking at things from abroad, it seems like a big headache to come to this region. Well, Although we're very, very small on the map. Well, I've had the good fortune of dealing with the uh, Middle East for 15 uh, years of, of my career. Uh, it's uh, really an issue uh, that I feel is uh, important and uh, an issue uh, that I burn for. Uh, so um, I couldn't think of any better place uh, to come uh, and study it uh, from up close uh, than uh, here in Israel. So. Uh, this is absolutely um, spot on for me. 
So, uh, first of all, Mr. Lars, Ambassador Lars of Albert Anderson, first of all, thank you very much for coming. We wish you a very, let's say, easy time uh, in this uh, region, although I'm not sure that you're going to have an easy time, especially not in our region, but it's always interesting, I think, here. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, in interview. Thank you very much for having me. And uh, thank you, our viewers, for staying with us tonight. Tomorrow we will be here at the same time, same place, from the Jaffa port. Have a great night.